When Talitha first approached me about contributing to the Sunday service, I think she was hoping I would have a nice story about animals healing or animals helping heal a person. I actually spent days trying to remember a story that would fit this theme, but with no luck. <laughs> then she sent us a scripture and the story that I meant to tell about healing became more clear. I read this gospel story as a one-time event, one small act of healing and redemption that would change the world as we know it. Jesus healed one man with mud, and though the story does not elaborate, his community was changed for the better, and the world took a different path. My story of one small act of healing, changing the world, culminated just last week. A woman named Wendy Moradian accepted an award for the University of Washington. She spearheaded the RIDE program, which trains dental students to treat patients in rural and underserved communities in the Pacific Northwest. To date, graduates of this program have given over 24,000 hours of dental care to rural and underserved communities. This award came after 10 years of work on behalf of the university, coordination with the NIH and the CDC, and countless grants, phone calls, and lobbying. This woman, this one woman dramatically changed dental care for rural and underserved communities with her tireless work and immeasurable effort. 25 years ago though, Wendy would have never thought this possible. In fact, 25 years ago, she was given a death sentence with a disease called progressive sclerosing cholangitis. This is where the immune system attacks and damages the bile ducts in the liver. She had severe liver inflammation, abscesses, and chronic disease. She was told the disease would progress to cancer of the bile ducts, which is fatal. The only hope given was a liver transplant, but she would not be put on the cadaver transplant list because her disease was of the bile ducts and not the liver itself. Wendy's disease progressed as expected. She became more and more ill. She endured, or she ensured that her will was up to date, and she spent as much time as possible with her elementary age children and her husband, thinking she likely wouldn't see them through high school graduation. In 1999, though, her doctor mentioned a new and experimental treatment and procedure <coughs> that had only been tried on a few patients, a live donor liver transplant. Wendy would have to find a healthy adult who would be willing to donate half of their liver to her. Her mother was the first choice, but she was elderly and her body size was too small. Her brother was the next reasonable choice, but he, he was severely overweight and a bad candidate for anesthesia. Her husband elected not to volunteer, as if something happened to Wendy, the children would need him. There were no other volunteers. So, most of you know me as Amanda Darby, but my maiden name is Moradian, and Wendy is my aunt, uh, the sister of my father. Um, news of the needed donor came to me via my grandmother, Wendy's mother, who was rejected as the donor. She was telling me so that I could pray for Wendy that a suitable donor would be found. Before that initial conversation even ended, I knew in my heart that I was being led to be the donor. I didn't say anything at that time, and I prayed and prayed that I wasn't crazy, that I wasn't acting rashly, and that I wasn't risking my life for nothing. I was just a third year veterinary student, was recently married, and I was only 22 years old. I prayed and prayed more. I talked with David, and I knew there was no other path besides the surgery. I knew in my heart that I could not live with myself if I did not walk this path. So I told Wendy that I thought I would be a suitable donor, and she accepted and we started the screening process to see if I was medically suitable. As you can imagine, the emotions surrounding this were and still are quite overwhelming, even 17 years later, and they're not part of this story, so I'll leave them be in my heart and in Wendy's. I had blood work, MRIs, CT scans, more blood work, and psychological counseling. And in February of 2000, the transplant team decided that I was a suitable donor and surgery was scheduled for May 10th, 2000. A few days prior, we traveled to Los Angeles where the transplant team was based at the University of Southern California. We were to be only the sixth procedure on the West Coast with only about 125 procedures being performed in the United States. Wendy's surgery lasted 10 hours and mine was seven. There were four surgeons between the two of us they removed 62% of my liver and placed it in Wendy after her diseased liver was removed. They removed part of my bile duct to make her a new one. The surgery was a complete success with literally no complications, large or small. My grandma chalks this up to the amount of prayers that were spoken before, during, and after. 
My liver grew back at an astounding rate, and it was back to its full size in less than six weeks. I returned to school in three weeks and graduated on time with my class. I successfully trained to run marathons and bore two healthy children. My liver that is now in Wendy was already 98% of her um, liver mass, and so it grew to full size in only two weeks. Within four days of the surgery, Wendy could already tell that she was healthier and that there were less toxins and infection in her, in her bot blood with the new liver. She's had several complications since then, but all were related to the surgery and none related to my liver. My liver remains healthy and fully functional in her. She was also only given five to 10 years to live after the transplant, enough to see her children graduate, and she was happy with that. But because of excellent nutrition and excellent care, we're now preparing to celebrate 17 years this May. So a small act of healing that literally saved a life, saved a mother so that she could raise her children, my cousins, to be strong and wonderful adults. That's all I saw at the time. I knew I could give the gift of life, save my aunt, protect my cousins from being orphans, protect my grandmother from having to bury her daughter. Like the gospel story, Jesus maybe only saw that he gave a man sight. But how could such a small thing turn into so much more? Do you remember the beginning of my story? How Wendy spearheaded changes in dental education to ensure that rural and underserved communities receive appropriate dental care? Without our little surgery, those thousands of folks may not have ever received dental care. Dental education in general may not have progressed to be as inclusive as it is now. Um, without my liver, Wendy would have never done all of these things. We don't know what amazing things the blind man in the story accomplished, but Jesus had his hand in Wendy's healing, and we have the story of the amazing things she has done when given a chance at new life. I was just approaching 40 when we entered the 1980s. Now that seems like so many years ago today. That is when I first heard about the sanctuary movement. I knew nothing about it until then and had no idea how much Betsy and I would become involved in it later. A little historical context would help. Many of you know this, some of you may be younger and not. The sanctuary movement then was a religious and political response to federal immigration policies which affected Central Americans specifically, those who came to the U.S. seeking asylums and visas. They were fleeing repression and violence caused by civil wars, notably village massacres, forced conscriptions into death squads, and other atrocities. The majority of these atrocities were committed in Guatemala and El Salvador then. Many tens of thousands of innocent people died, some say over 100,000. If that same percentage that occurred in those two small countries happened in the United States, it would represent two million deaths. From 1980 through 1991, an estimated one million Central Americans crossed our southern border. A study in 1984 indicated that 3% obtained visas, while the U.S. granted 100% of the applications from Cubans leaving under the Castro regime, 60% to Iranians, and 40% to Afghanis who came here during the Soviet invasion. But Two years earlier, in 1983, where another sample was taken and public records were examined, only one Guatemalan was granted asylum. At the peak following the early lead of the Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, 500 congregations in the United States by then had declared themselves sanctuaries. They committed in varying degrees to provide shelter, material goods, services, and in some cases, legal aid. They included almost entirely Christians and Jews during the 1980s. More recently, Muslim mosques have joined in the new sanctuary movement for Central Americans. Mm -hmm. The common imperative for the old and the new movements was the interpretation of biblical and societal teachings that people deserve protection and had a right to sanctuary, particularly in churches. 
We were members of the First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, in Wilmette, Illinois, a predominantly white, middle to upper class neighborhood on Chicago's <laughs> North Shore. After a number of meetings and conversations, members voted to declare ours a sanctuary church. In our litany of sanctuary dedication, which occurred in 1983, we said in part of it, when referring to the future, we offer all that we are and all that we have. We will listen, we will help. With us in this sanctuary, you are safe. I don't think many of us knew what we were getting into. I certainly did not. And what followed was eye-opening for me. Some months after that, we accepted three brothers from El Salvador and became responsible for them in every way. They had been through repressive and frightening conditions. They would have been conscripted forcefully into the National Army shortly after that time with orders which included torturing and killing other civilians or be murdered themselves. I did not appreciate the likely depth of those psychological and emotional traumas from living with death around them. There were cultural and language barriers. There was a lack of education in basics. Diets were different. They were teenagers. It was hard for us to relate to each other, but over time and with great effort, basic human needs for shelter, food, clothing, and health care were met. But where would this all end? This was new to us. I, for one, certainly didn't know. Many of our neighbors in the community were sympathetic, but many were not. There were fears, rumors, and tension. Some new members joined our congregation while others left because of our stand and the actions we took. But in general, the congregation held to its commitment. The end came when one of the brothers was accused of preying on a child in the community. While the grounds for the charge were questioned, there could be no practical defense at that time. It was a very painful time for the brothers and for us. The brothers had to be sent away for their safety, and today it would not be a surprise to know that the destination for refuge in the 1980s was Canada. The passage of the brothers out of the United States and with some danger across the border into Canada was made possible by other Christian men and women. When the brothers arrived and requested status, Canada granted them asylum because it honored the United Nations Protocol for the Treatment of Refugees and the Geneva Conventions. In this situation, I was blind, but I believe that I came to see immigrants and refugees fleeing terror, threats to their lives, and repression in an entirely new light. The brothers reflected back in living form a witness to the tragedies in Central mm -hmm. Americans. We could not change federal policies at that time, which labeled the brothers and many others in their situation, economic refugees. Well, we continue to provide funds, training, and arms to the armies of those most repressive Central American countries. This was done in the name of fighting communism, which was too close to home. But we still worked together as a faith community to save lives in that ancient tradition of providing sanctuary. I remember this eye-opening experience today when I am with immigrants and refugees among us here in Santa Fe, helping to serve us in public places and seeking our help in the shelter. When Talitha called and asked if I would share an experience when my eyes had been opened, or perhaps a healing, my first thought was, I don't think so. <laughs> but as you may know, it is difficult to say no to Talitha. As I started to reflect, I wondered what situation Talitha might want me to share today. <clears throat> I've known Talitha for approximately 23 years. 
There must be one specific situation that she wanted me to share. As I continue to reflect, there were many times that I have, been, have experienced physical, emotional, and spiritual healing, but I will share just one. A few years before moving to New Mexico, I had gone through a divorce. The pain of promises broken and an uncertain future for my children and me was devastating. Anger, fear, disappointment are just a few of the emotions that one has when going through such an event. I prayed, friends prayed, family prayed, but God did not heal my marriage. Now I was both emotionally and spiritually empty. God did not answer my prayers, but I learned that God does not always answer our prayers in the way we think they should be answered. It, may, it took many years from before I was emotionally and spiritually healed. I recall one Easter, about four to five years after moving to Santa Fe, my children were going to visit their dad and stepmom in Colorado. I decided that we should make an Easter basket for them to take to their dad and stepmother. We had fun dyeing eggs, putting candy and other goodies in the basket. When I shared this with a friend, she couldn't believe I could do that. After all, these were the people that were responsible for so much pain in our lives. I hadn't even thought about that. I just thought it would be fun and a nice surprise. That moment was when I realized that there was healing. My eyes were opened. I encourage you to, to reflect. Your eyes will be open, and you too will know that you have been healed. Thank you.